In my previous video on the Somerset Coal Canal, I remarked that Somerset is generally not considered as an industrial county, nor much associated with mining in the modern popular consciousness. However, the region actually has an extensive history of mining, and not just for coal, but also for lead, zinc, copper and various other metals and minerals, a history which is both ancient and extremely important. To first quantify the ancient part, Evidence of human habitation on the Mendip Hills goes back about as far as anywhere in Britain. With Cheddar Man, the oldest complete skeleton in the country at over 9,000 years old, being found in a cave in Cheddar Gorge. Some evidence of lead mining here is found from the Late Bronze Age, and by the Iron Age it seems apparent that this was happening on a pretty big scale by pre-industrial standards. Big enough, in fact, to attract the attention of the dominant civilization of the time, the Romans. Which leads me to the extremely important claim. British history would of course look pretty different with no Roman invasion. And while it would obviously be highly remiss of me to imply anything as oversimplified as the Romans conquered Britain to get Mendip lead, because for starters there were other major lead mines in Derbyshire, Yorkshire and elsewhere, not to mention Cornish tin, Welsh gold, and the multitude of factors not relating to metal extraction at all. It is undoubtedly true that the presence of these resources drove Roman engagement with southern Britain even before the conquest, and was an important motivator of their invasion. True to the stereotype of the Roman civilization as technologically advanced and heavy on infrastructure and engineering, they promptly took lead mining to another level. Here at Charterhouse there is evidence of Roman occupation and mining from as early as 49 CE, just six years after the invasion and only a couple of years after this part of Britain was secured. This speed suggests they took over and ramped up an existing industry rather than prospected from scratch. The Romans built a fort here to defend their mine and a small town and an amphitheatre to boot. At least that's the usual story. Unfortunately, there's almost nothing to see in terms of Roman remains, and much as I love Time Team, my budget doesn't stretch to geophysics teams or helicopter LIDAR surveys, so you'll pretty much have to take my word for the fact that the Roman fort was, um, somewhere over there. In fact, at least one paper has questioned whether the fort structure would really have had much military value, positing that it could have been more like a head office for the mines. And at least one archaeologist has suggested that the supposed Roman amphitheatre is actually a Neolithic enclosure. And given the generous sprinkling of Neolithic tumuli, earthworks and monuments in the region, this strikes me as entirely plausible, but I'm in no way qualified to confirm. Roman ingots of lead, now in the Wells and Mendit Museum, are stamped with Brit X Arg Veb meaning British lead from the Veb silverworks, suggesting the Roman name for this charterhouse settlement began with Veb. Someone has reconstructed Vebriacum, but by what means or how credible this is, I don't know. The reference to silverworks is interesting. Lead here is found in an ore called Galena, which is also generally an important source of silver. Although it only contains half a percent silver at most, this often ends up being worth more than the lead. Therefore, it was long assumed that the Romans were at least equally interested in getting at the silver as the lead, via a process called capillation, intending to use it to pay their locally stationed armies. Some have even framed the lead output as a mere byproduct of silver mining. However, recent research indicates that silver was not a desired material during most of the Iron Age, and was therefore not extracted from Mendip lead, even where the levels in the ore would have made it worthwhile to do so. This appears to have been a cultural choice and not a technological limitation. The author further asserts that there's remarkably little evidence that the Romans significantly changed matters in this regard, pointing to a lack of archaeological evidence of cupellation facilities and analysis of local lead artefacts suggesting that the lead had usually not undergone desilvering processes, Matthew Ponting concludes that it's likely, in fact, silver was more of a bonus byproduct of the lead mining than vice versa, and a sporadic and small scale byproduct at that. The Romans certainly had plenty of uses for the lead, 
with Charterhouse lead being used to line the baths at Bath and being found as far afield as Pompeii. The methods used to extract the lead created this distinctive post-industrial landscape which locals call Gruffy Ground. The visible impact on the landscape was large because this mining mostly occurred near the surface. Veins of lead ore were found at a rather shallow depth and were excavated in horizontal channels known as rakes. The Romans did also sink some vertical shafts to try and find deeper veins but without much success so excavation focused on these horizontal trenches near the surface. In person, some of these feel like quite dramatic mini gorges, although I fear on camera this doesn't entirely come across. This rake, for example, is the largest here at several hundred metres long, about 20 metres wide and 5 metres deep, and today the exposed mini cliffs of limestone are a popular venue for bouldering. With Cheddar Gorge, just a couple of miles from here, you could be forgiven for thinking these miniature canyons are a natural formation. While most of the excavation would have been done by hand, the Romans also engaged in a form of hydraulic mining, that is, using water, in a process known as hushing. They built dams to create reservoirs of water, and then demolished those dams so that the resultant wave of water flooding down the valley would scour away the soil and vegetation, leaving the bedrock exposed, with any veins of ore therein hopefully visible. As usual, I am paranoid of accidentally misleading or oversimplifying, so I should note that while we do know that Romans used the hushing technique in general, there isn't definite evidence that they did so here, and even if they did, the reservoirs I'm showing here to illustrate it are definitely not Roman, nor for hushing. These were constructed to supply water for processing and washing. Washing was the first step in processing the galena to extract the lead, taking place in a series of buddle pits, circular depressions about half a metre deep and 8 to 11 metres in diameter. I thought at the time that this might be an example of a buddle pit, so I filmed it, but it's clearly a lot smaller than 8 metres across, so with hindsight, perhaps not. You can see them quite clearly on the satellite mode of your favourite online mapping service, though. After washing, the ore could be smelted. For smelting, you need to heat up your ore, and also add a material known as a flux. The chemistry is beyond me, but it's basically an additive which helps separate the good stuff from the useless stuff. The lead industry here would have benefited enormously from the fact that both requirements could be amply supplied locally. The Somerset Coalfield, just a few miles east, provided the fuel for furnaces, while Mendip is literally made of limestone, which serves as a decent flux when smelting lead or iron. In the post-Roman period, the lead mining seems to have declined, although still continued on a smaller scale. Around the 12th and 13th centuries, documents show mining rights were owned by the church. By the 17th century, though, it was more of a free-for-all, with any man discovering a vein able to stake a claim and start a mine there and this seems to have driven production to perhaps its highest level, or at least the highest since the Romans, with 70 tonnes produced in 1610. In fact, production was so voracious in the 1600s that by the turn of the century the accessible veins had been completely exhausted. Mining technology in the early 18th century was not up to the challenge of accessing deeper veins, especially with regards to drainage, so activity more or less ceased. But by the end of the 18th century, the Industrial Revolution was brewing, and with the aid of steam engines for pumping water, amongst various other technological advances, Cornish miners were quite literally taking mining to a whole new level. It was therefore not long before hopeful landowners and investors hired in this renowned Cornish expertise, convinced that further rich veins of lead would be found deep beneath the Roman and medieval workings. In 1844, a firm by the name of Mendip Hills Mining Company began operating at Charterhouse, and their Cornish miners sank shafts up to 100 metres in depth. Unfortunately, the simple geological fact of the matter was that Galena only existed in any significant quantities near the surface, petering out entirely by 50 metres down. After three years of expensive digging and not a single worthwhile deep-level vein to show for it, the company turned their attention to another tactic, 
reprocessing the immense piles of slag left behind by their Iron Age, Roman and medieval predecessors. As these earlier generations had lacked blast furnaces and other such technology, their waste heaps still contained significant amounts of retrievable lead. Specifically, the company found the slag to contain about 17% lead, whereas the slimes, a mixture of clay with the watery runoff from previous refinement processes, contained easily twice that, in some cases incredibly up to 57% lead. The layer of slag and slimes was several metres deep across a huge area, in places up to 7 metres deep, so this represented a serious amount of lead. To cash in on this, the company built extensive infrastructure, obliterating most of the Roman archaeology in the process. Here, for example, we see the remains of their condensing flues. These were a series of 100 metre long tunnels, which drew through the fumes from the blast furnaces, with some further lead being deposited on the bricks from where it could be scraped off. Perhaps the biggest infrastructure, though, was the system of water provision, with the large reservoirs I showed you earlier, and a complex series of troughs and leats to supply this wherever needed for washing ore, powering water wheels and so forth. In 1848 this system was wrecked by a gathering of 40 or 50 rioters from Cheddar, and although the mining company won a legal case against them, with historical hindsight it's kind of hard not to be on the side of the rioters. See, the reason they were keen to destroy the company's operations was that they were severely polluting Cheddar's water supply. It was common practice for the toxic runoff from the buddle pits to be diverted into the nearest convenient swallet or sinkhole. Unfortunately, the cast geology of the Mendips means that this doesn't just disappear into the bowels of the earth, rather the huge cave systems in the limestone form giant river systems, and in this case the polluted water emptied into Cheddar's fish ponds. One of the company's own staff later admitted he had tested the water in those ponds and found up to 8% lead contamination. It was a similar story elsewhere. In the 1860s, the owners of the Wookie Hole paper mill suspected the lead works near Pretty to be responsible for polluting their water, and proved it by dyeing the water entering St Cuthbert's Swallet, thus establishing for the first time that this was a source of the River Axe. Intriguingly, cavers still haven't figured out which swallet near Charterhouse links up to Cheddar, or at least they hadn't in 1984 when my source was written. Pollution woes didn't stop there. In 1855, the Mendip Hills Mining Company were obliged to buy a neighbouring farm for £8,330 after the courts adjudged their smelter fumes to have rendered it unfit for farming. To this day, the high levels of lead result in this site and other lead mining locations such as Smitham Hill, shown here, supporting rare lead-tolerant species like spring sandwort, dwarf mouse ear and lead moss. Unfortunately, I lacked both the time and the expertise to actually find any examples of these species, so I'm just giving you generic shots of the plant life and you'll have to pretend that these are exciting rarities. Still, since when have we let environmental destruction stand in the way of hearty profits? These incidents didn't cripple the company. On the contrary, the 1850s was a high point for the company, with over 300 employees at the Charterhouse operation, producing somewhere between 10 to 100 tonnes a month, depending on which source you ask and which year you're talking about. Unsurprisingly, this success prompted entrepreneurs to exploit the slags and slimes of other ancient lead mining venues in similar fashion. Here at Smitham Hill, a few miles away, a group of Cornish miners built smelting works in 1867 to reprocess waste. This was initially successful, with some sources claiming that it produced 1,000 tonnes a year by 1870, although I'm a teeny bit sceptical as that figure far outstrips even the more optimistic numbers floating around for the much bigger operation at Charterhouse. At any rate, while initially successful, the Smitham Hill venture was short-lived. By 1875 the facility had closed and all the buildings except the chimney were demolished. Operations at Charterhouse survived a decade longer, but dwindling reserves of material to reprocess and a fall in the price of lead meant that it too was forced to close in 1885. 
The buildings there were demolished soon after, leaving this chimney as the last major standing remnant of an industry that had existed here for at least 2,000 years. Renovated in 1914, it was threatened with demolition in the 70s, before the Mendip Society secured its survival and renovated it once more in 1973. In 1987 it became a Grade 2 listed building and today sits in the middle of a Forestry Commission woodland. Anyway, that's all for this video. If I have somehow failed to say your desire for lead-related content, you could check out my video on the world's first shot tower in nearby Bristol. Alternatively, I have a few videos on other historical curiosities of Somerset too. Thanks as usual to everyone whose work I built on in making this video, and special thanks to my mum who discovered the chimney and thereby put me onto this topic in the first place. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe in case I make any more. Cheers!